because I'm here to talk to you about something that's uh, pretty disturbing in terms of a technology set that began in the uh, the bowels of Hollywood in terms of uh, uh, technique for being creative with media. And we'll talk about how this particular type of technology is actually wreaking havoc for providing misinformation, misrepresentation, perpetration. The uh, the actual description or name that it's been given is called deep fake. And what it basically represents is uh, a possible chaotic um, weapon that can be used by individuals just having fun, hacker groups, nation states, foreign governments, etc., in order to create havoc against society, individuals that are targets or people of interest um, from different threat actors. So we're going to dive into an interesting conversation. I'm I, uh, very pleased to have a chance to, to to address everybody on this topic, but uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll uh, hopefully won't make uh, everybody too paranoid about um, this type of technology and and how this type of technology is actually evolving into new and concerning threat patterns. Um, my name is uh, Tony Ucita Velez. I am the CEO of Versprite Cybersecurity. It's a company out of Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm based right now. And uh, I'm also an author of a uh, threat modeling book called Risk-Centric Threat Modeling. It was actually endorsed uh, by the cybersecurity czar at the White House um, in 2015 under the Obama administration. And it's a book that really discusses how to model threats, mostly for applications, and the focus of threat modeling also relates to organizations. I bring it up because it's a, um, it's a relevant topic for what we're going to talk about today the threat of perpetration, misrepresentation, information, manipulation for the purposes of creating hysteria for various polit uh, political, social, economic, geopolitical reasons. I uh, am the CEO, as I mentioned, and I have about 25 years of information security and IT experience. And what we do is we help a lot of companies around the world to address cybersecurity attacks. And like every year that this particular landscape of attacks um, is affecting more and more organizations each and every day. The agenda for today is we're going to obviously dive into understanding what are deep fakes. How does it affect you, your families, your workplace, your you know, your employer, your societies? You know everything from your uh, your neighborhood to your county to your city to your state, and of course you know as as a nation. We'll look at some common trends and attack patterns to how this particular and, and rapidly evolving technology can actually become a sophisticated attack pattern to be used by multiple different threat actors. And we'll look at a little bit about the science behind it, just to kind of understand how does it even work. Um, we'll also take a look at what's being done today to combat the tools, the, the proliferation of the the technology, the ability to perpetrate people's voices, people's even likeness and image, and um, and what that means for for us as members of society. And then you know we'll we'll look at both commercial and consumer or individual uh, mitigations that you should already be considering as part of your even individual uh, or personal uh, cybersecurity hygiene, so to speak. So let's go ahead and dive in. And there will be some media that will also be shared through this presentation. Hopefully, it'll go through. We did a we did a test of it before we got started, but uh, you know the demo gods might might have uh, something to say about that. Let's dive into the definition. So the, the deep fake is actually a term that came from deep learning and uh, just simply fake content, and it's basically synthetic media or a fabricated image or video. It could also be a fabricated audio that's meant to use to impersonate or perpetrate someone else. And there is, from a cyber criminal sense, there's a lot of different use cases or abuse cases, as we say, in terms of why that would be very attractive for a cyber criminal. Um, how this technology works is that there's typically some form of software that analyzes pictures, video, voice, uh, in order to create brand new content. So everything I just said, for example, right now, if it was being recorded into, let's say, an MP3 file, could be you know, inserted or inputted, ingested into a deep fake 
producing software that could someone could actually create a script and I could be saying something totally different. And we'll look at some examples about that. The problem with deepfakes is that it's so convincing and it's getting better and better each and every month almost. I mean, there is a lot of interest. Um, it, it began really in the entertainment industry. There's a lot of interest of people um, in entertainment and media at the individual level, creative arts, that have really looked to see how can they use this for their own you know, creative content benefit. But the problem is this, is that with good intentions, oftentimes there is abuse of those intentions and in order to, you know, for, for criminal purposes and for perpetration and misrepresentation, and that's what we're, we're, we're challenged with, right? So you know, there used to be that cliche, well, I got to see it to believe it. Um, and now with, with the, the, the threat of deep fakes, we, we basically you know, can't necessarily just simply believe in something that we actually see or hear, even though as humans, we recognize the image, we recognize the mannerisms, we recognize the in voice intonations, and everything that might seem to be like Aunt Betty or you know, Uncle Robert, whatever, but in fact, it's actually a fabricated content uh, aimed at perpetrating those individuals. So there's, there's a lot of things at stake here, and we're going to look at an example here where this is um, the uh, infamous soccer star David Beckham from England. Where de So I talked about the origins a little bit of how Hollywood, really deep fake technology, was really came from um, you know, um, the, the, the media industry, the Hollywood industry, um, and really the intent was is to have creative uses for uh, creating audio content, video content, um, you know, just from still images or other video. So we'll look at, look at the power and look at you know, the coolness, if you will, of this particular video. This is not an abuse. This is actually legitimate content that was really meant to allow for this international soccer star to say a, a very important message around malaria uh, in multiple different languages. So let's take a listen. And I have the chat up, so if uh, you guys cannot hear this, just please let me know or just uh, you know, raise, raise your hand on the chat. Malaria isn't just any disease. It's the deadliest disease there's ever been. Se dice que ha matado más de la mitad de la población que ha existido. Speak up and say, malaria must die. One voice can be powerful, but all of our voices together, then they will have to listen. Malaria must die. Okay, so there again we see, you know, the the I don't know if you guys, you know, some of you in the audience might speak multiple languages, and as you pronounce different words, um, obviously your your you know lower jaw, your intonation, everything looks di different, um, and so but deepfake technology actually has the ability to learn facial muscle actions um, by basically plotting muscle reactions as, as different words are pronounced. And so what the software does is it remembers that and it tries to create a mapping to a dictionary in multiple different languages in order to emulate how that face should pronounce something, you know, visually and then match it with the audio. So again, that malaria piece that was shown there was a, uh, a constructive form of how the origins of defect technology was used by Hollywood in order to do a, um, a health you know, campaign P, uh, public service announcement. Um, let's talk a little bit about you know, the, the implications and where this is in terms of the U.S. government, and, and not just the U.S. government, but multiple other governments that are, are already having this very much in their radar. And the military is having this in their radar, the Department of Homeland Security, 
And, uh, you know, this is very much an opportunity of this technology to provide, you know, social, uh, social hype and social misrepresentation to a whole new level. So let's take a listen here. Um, Senator Cruz is going to, um, is going to mention some things here. Oh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Ruby is going to mention some things here. Imagine a compelling video like this produced on the eve of an election or a few days before a major public policy decision with a culture that's already in, uh, uh, with, has already a kind of a built-in bias towards believing outrageous things, a media that is quick to promulgate it um, and, and spread it, and, of course, the social media where you can't stop its spread. I believe that this is the next wave of attacks against America and Western democracies is the ability to produce fake videos that are can only be determined to be fake after extensive analytical analysis, and by then the election's over, and millions of Americans have seen an image that they want to believe anyway because of their preconceived bias against that individual. Imagine a... So what uh, Senator Rubio is talking about is not just something that is just a U.S. concern. You know, it, it should be a concern for any government. You know, uh, Russia should be concerned. You know, China should be concerned. Um, those on the receiving end of nation state attacks in Western Europe, Eastern Europe, there's really no government that shouldn't be concerned. And the reason is, is that the content creation is so good that it can perpetrate anyone, uh, whether it be a political figure or a movie star or a prominent leader, a business leader, and it could basically, you know, that, that, individual that content can actually say things to defame that individual to undermine their cause etc and um and so it's it's a powerful tool but let's try to understand what are some of the traditional attack patterns that have actually used uh deep fake technology to date and we begin with you know i i i i'm a big fan of threat modeling and we begin with a simple threat library if you will which is simply a fancy term for a threat list or a list of threats and I invite the audience sitting there today, as you start to understand a little bit more about what deepfakes is, maybe start to think about, and I would love to see in the chat room, what are some of your uh, thoughts in terms of what would be a threat library for, uh, for NASA or for a federal agency or even from an consu individual consumer level. But uh, threat motives that have happened to date are usually driven by extortion. Um, this has been the predominant rationale for deep fake in, uh, in terms of an abuse case where usually a prominent individual has a deep fake video made of him or her and the criminal cyber criminal is looking to extort of uh, you know uh, payment from them because of something that's defaming and a lot of it is really unfortunately has started out by trying to extort female actresses um, that are basically there's deep fake videos that are produced of them in uh, not so flattering ways, and there is financial repercussions that are demanded by these cyber criminals. Another one is related to financial fraud. If we think about consumer banking, consumer finance, you know, before you know we used to back in the 80s or so, we used to go to the bank and you know you meet individually with a teller. Now think about all the different means and ways in which authentication of a bank holder is done. You know you have um, authentication through username and password. You have authentication through you know biometrics. You know through fingerprint. You have authentication through even voice. Uh, you have authentication through other pieces of information. That is going to continue, especially as security leaders try to find you know, ways to incorporate unique values of an individual to make sure that it is them and they can interact with them. Deep fake technology has the capability to undermine all that because the technology is aimed to uh, perpetrate voice mannerisms, you know, video, v visual representations of that, of that individual and so forth. So it, it poses a problem for making a phone call as a financial controller or CFO and demanding that payment be done to a fictitious vendor and just over a very realistic phone call that has the same exact accent and mannerisms of maybe the real CFO or controller. Targeted social engineering has been a problem in cybersecurity for a long time and it's really one of the precepts for different types of attacks against any organization. Part of attacking any organization is trying to understand 
who works there, what are their roles, what are their emails, what are their habits, and to be able to uh, incorporate yourself as an attacker into your, their workflow as a victim. And deepfakes allows for the ability to uh, create a trust between the cyber criminal that is looking to perpetrate someone legitimate with a target victim. Again, someone might be in finance or accounting, et cetera, or maybe an executive. Defamation really is, goes very closely to that first one. There's been a lot of defamation attempts. Um, if we think about the future, let's say, elections, you know, going well beyond uh, this, this recent election, you can think about you know, new candidates, state, local level candidates, future presidential candidates, and the in in this day and age where we consume information in 140 characters, you know, uh, or in so through, mostly through social media platforms, and the pace of our society is so fast, it's really difficult. And this is one of the, the inherent challenges with deep fake technology. It's really difficult to discern fact from fiction. And so um, a a group looking to defame an individual and align them with maybe some causes that they're actually not affiliated with might actually fulfill to, to, to reduce the voter uh, support that they get you know, at a state election or Senate election, et cetera. Mass hysteria is one of the bigger you know, challenges. There might be a nation state that is looking to, and oftentimes um, sites, uh, psychological warfare has long been a weapon by both the U.S. military and foreign militaries. Um, you know, they, they in, you know, going back to before the Internet, they used um, different pieces of information, um, handouts, et cetera, in order to, to basically misinform societies, in order to break alliances and support for regimes that were uh, targeted as, as the enemy. So fast forward to today, how does deep fake technology create mass hysteria? There might be already sensitive topics that are in front of us as society, and so if we have deep fake technologies that are promoting greater division, greater polarity of views and, and, and uh, between different factions in society, this allows for a foreign nation state to you know, create that as a weapon in, in addition to other types of you know, uh, you know, warfare fair techniques, financial, um, you know, financial, economic, um, trade, etc., so a lot of interesting things. Now, if we look at the threat actors from the past using this stuff, we see, you know, not necessarily a threat actor, but the the, con the consumers, the main users of this type of technology have been film industry professionals. Now, a lot of those individuals have colluded with or actually have helped uh, cyber criminals do some of the extortion that is affecting like a lot of prominent movie stars, largely, unfortunately, female. But... Um, other threat actors that are on the list are extortionists, hacktivists, and nation states. Before we get into some interesting numbers, I wanted to again reiterate for everyone to just, uh, if you're interested in just kind of sharing through the chat, like what are some of your own ideas for a threat that should be in a threat library? I would be really interested to hear what you know your your takes are, what your thoughts are as it relates to fabricated video, fabricated audio, fabricated you know content. Um, Here's some interesting numbers related to uh, deep fakes. So we have here um, in the majority of the uh, uh, targeted sectors has been in the entertainment industry. And this is a stat from you know, 2020. So I completely think that um, we're going to see the political slice of the pie to be you know, vastly uh, augmented you know, in the next you know, two years. Uh, Two to three years definitively. I wouldn't be surprised if it was, you know, clo uh, over you know 25 percent to 30 percent. But you see other you know industries there. You have the fashion industry, which again really kind of falls under entertainment, where there could be a lot of extortion to some supermodels or whatnot. Sport athletes as well. You know, they're iconic. They have brands. Um, you know, LeBron James. You have uh, different individuals in different sports, women's soccer. And if there is a uh, deep fake. Uh, video from a cyber criminal that is looking to simply cash out and say, "Give me 25k," because I'm I'm going to have a video of you saying this stuff, or maybe 10k. The the cyber criminal, what they're trying to do, their business model is to create a content that defames the target individual at a price point that 
they won't blink at so that they can just go away. And if they pay that, they hope to go to others and repeat that you know, business model. So here is, um, you know, from Hollywood, there's been a lot of companies, this is, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different applications, even now mobile applications, that with the convenience of your, your own mobile device, Android or iOS, you can create your own deep fake uh, video on somebody. And here we see a, um, a Chinese app called the Zao app. And it was released in September. And uh, there was a lot of backlash on this app, particularly because it really manipulated a lot of the content that was created by somebody. And it really harvested that content. So you had the the app the application provider that you know it wasn't just like hey end user create funny videos you know of your friends and make them the star of you know your favorite blockbuster movie. It was instead let me actually take that and I'm going to harvest that content without you knowing it user, and I'm going to maybe use it for my own purposes. And so um, there was a there was a big big privacy backlash uh, in China. Uh, it wasn't here. It was, it was in China. That privacy backlash was in China, as, as entertaining as that thought might be. But the, the, um, the, there was a big backlash. And but as we look at this, we see a Game of Thrones, you know, kind of setting. And you know, you could basically replicate some other individuals in a, in a pretty uh, good way, I would say. I mean, I think that, you know, it doesn't look like it's a, a blatant cutout. This is one of the least um, uh, sophisticated tools that are out there. But this allows for, you know, from going back to a cyber criminal sense, the ability to be able to have the ease of use to have produced content over mobile technologies really facilitates a lot of social engineering to a whole new level. All right, let's take a look at some other interesting numbers related to deepfakes. Now, what's interesting is that the majority of targets is really in the United States. You know, there's a, most of the targeted victims, the targeted victims have been, you know, geared towards the United States. And this is concerning at multiple different levels. You know, there's individuals within the United States that might be using this against targets in the United States. But predominantly, there's, you know, if we look at a lot of the countries here represented, you know, a lot of them, you know, if you look at the United States has alliances with all of these countries right here. So, you know, there, there is a informal supposition that one could be you know, infer that and there has been a lot of use of defake technologies by the Chinese, by the Russians, and this is going to be an interesting type of technology to be weaponized at, at, a, at a broader level. Um, you know, and, and a simple example is this, you know, Facebook, and I would say regretfully, uh, as long with other social media technologies, is such an integrated fabric of our society today, right? Social media in general, not, not, not just Facebook. Um, and so a lot of what we get the news from, how we view different things um, in our societies comes from these social media platforms. And what happens if the information on that, those platforms is simply replicated, but, and not only replicated, but it's, it's fake information. It's not even validated information. But it, all it takes is for one, two, or ten, or a hundred, or a thousand users to echo this sentiment or this content. And then it becomes almost like factual, you know, because we as, as Americans have, because of the pace of life, and for a lot of different societal reasons, I think that it makes it easy to just simply say, hey, I saw this. And we don't ask ourselves the question of, is this true? Is this valid? You know, we're, we're, let me take time to see where this actually came from. So those are some concerning things. Um, let's take a look at the top threat motive of deepfakes. And we see on the right-hand side, so this is a ranking of the, the top uh, victims, uh, active victims of deepfake technology. So you look on the right-hand, uh, the kind of like the portrait uh, image there of a, a, kind of like a montage of different actresses, uh, actors. We we basically see predominantly female, and uh, what it shows there. I don't know if you can see that. Actually, let me let me see if I can uh, use the magnifying glass here. Um, so what it shows here is you see a vulnerabilities found, and then you see a monthly growth, and then you see a risk rating. 
So Emma Watson seems to be leading the kind of the victim chart, if you will, of content that's out there that is deep fake te- that's been recognized and labeled as deep fake technology of her. You know, followed by all these other actors that are that are listed. Um, kind of fanning out from here, you know, we see you know Donald Trump here at the end, and it could be you know maybe it's you know it actually we see on the left hand we see that Joe Biden is actually a runner up. Uh, so these are only these are filtered by political figures. These on the right, let me just use this uh, laser pointer. Um, so the, these here on the right were the top overall victims, uh, regardless of what industry they're in. And these right here was filtered. Which which of the of the most kind of like political activists slash activists uh, were basically uh, found to be um, top in terms of having deep fake videos of them? So Joe Biden, I'm sure this number is going to go up as well, um, because really it doesn't matter if there's central groups, left groups, right groups, different factions here and there, foreign nation states. There's different motives why you know groups in China, groups in Russia, groups in different places um, are going to have an interest to creating these types of content to instigate, to uh, kind of stir the pot, if you will, and kind of unravel the fabric of society. So let's talk a little bit about the means and ways in which um, you know the the, the technology the, the, you know how this technology can actually be weaponized. So that first off, there's a there's multiple different technologies that are out there. Some open source, some are you know university research projects. And the interesting thing about universities is you know if you remember you know having attended one, maybe you have some children in college that universities by design are open campuses. Their information repositories where a lot of their research is actually found is has inherently had struggled to apply cybersecurity best practices. Um, and so as a result, think about like a new emerging deep fake technology that is discovered in uh, a university and uh, it, that technology gets out. You know, universities again, because of the openness and, and the collaboration of of uh, just simply university experience, especially in research, really their networks also give way to that level of openness, which is a problem. You know, because you have cyber criminals know that if you're going to get really emerging technologies that might be of advanced that won't be detected by some of the commercial tools that are out there, go to university and see what various PhD, master students, even engineering students that are undergrad might be working on. So a lot of concern there, a lot of kind of things start to, you know, a lot of points kind of start to put together. Let's listen to this particular tool. This is a uh, real-time cloning toolbox. Um, and see if you can catch, you know, how this works is basically it takes like I said before, it takes an actual audio feed, a legitimate one, and the software learns through AI. It, it learns your pattern, your intonation, how you say different words, and then the software allows for a user to type out whatever, you know, to type out a script, if you will. And then the human doesn't say the script. It's the software that says the script, now having learned the voice. So let's take a listen here real quick. This is a voice cloning toolbox. It allows you to clone the voice of someone from only five seconds of audio and to synthesize speech with that same voice. Really, really was impressed with them. I thought that they did so well. And it was a tough final, you know, I think. There's a way to measure the acute emotional intelligence that has never gone out of style. Thanks. So I'm going to pause it for a second. The second part of every example is the fabricated content. And so, you know, you heard kind of this like uh, English accent or Great Britain accent, um, and then you, you hear, you're going to hear the same, in the second sample, you're going to hear the same, um, the same phrase for every different individual that's perpetrated or that's, um, you know, imitated. So here's the second sample. It do not work, and you just kind of barrel through it, you know, you get through it. You... There's a way to measure the acute emotional intelligence that has never gone out of style. And the other thing also was the format of the show. There's a way to measure the acute emotional intelligence that has never gone out of style. 
So I'll stop there. I mean, there's multiple different examples, but you have the authentic voice of talking about whatever. And you have three different samples, human samples, and then you basically have the software read a standard script in the imitated voice. So um, there's many projects out there that are open source again that you know they're going to draw the attention of hobbyists, you know, people in the entertainment industry. Um, people that are also that are individual hackers that just want to have a good time and kind of play. Hackers sometimes hack things for, as they say, the lolts, just for the, you know, the grins and giggles, so to speak. And so, um, but you know, the more concerning aspect is how this can be weaponized to divide societies, to defame individuals, um, and at prominent leaders and companies uh, create misinformation. Um, perpetrate, you know, um, you know, voices of leadership. So all this stuff can affect f um, people that are loyal to a company, loyal to a leader, loyal to, you know, a government official, or not necessarily loyal, but m more in terms of like to simply um, respecting them or, uh, you know, abiding by what some of the, the visions that they might have. The toolbox is <sighs> so. Let's take a look more about. The means and ways. This technology is low tech. It's open source. Some of it's commercial. Um, so with the commercial software, you get even better quality results. It's not just audio. It's also you know video. So um, you know the way it works again is in order for the software to synthesize and create this, it has to get samples, samples of video, samples of voice. And then what they what it, the way most of these software components work is there is a text to speech synthesis that is done, and um, so the voice conversion is what we heard. We we heard some of those. It converts the raw samples. It learns the intonation of those raw samples, and it tries to apply what it learned about the accent, uh, the pace of that speaker, so that it can fabricate it when the user of the software creates any scripts. Now, in terms of cybersecurity attack patterns, there's a, a term called vishing. You might have heard of phishing with a PH, which is an email, you know, fraud, you know, email-based uh, attacks where someone is trying to get you to do something that you shouldn't do over email. Vishing is over the, uh, you know, the phone medium. So, um, some examples, you know, may include, let's say, if um, let, let's say there's a financial advisor that's pretty prominent, maybe in your area where you live, and uh, they they basically have uh, you know clients to which um, that uh, you know they interface with in order to talk about quarterly investments or whatnot. As a cyber criminal, you know you might be interested in capturing the voice of this individual, knowing that they are interfacing with people that are giving them their money or allowing them to make a substantial investments in different you know d different vehicles financial vehicles. So you're capturing the audio of this individual who has clients in, in, uh, that are giving them money um, so that there could be a vishing phone call to say, hey, uh, I just want to talk to you about your portfolio. Again, it'll sound like them. The pace of how they talk will, will, be, will be the same. And with you can even leave the same phone number that they always use. There, there's, you know, if this, you could, you could. Th there's a lot of ways in which you could actually have the the phone number that is used by a legitimate person and have that be redirected. But we won't get into that uh, in this conversation. But the point is, is that perpetrating voice, that you know, the intonation, maybe the the country slang, or you know, uh, maybe the the northern like you know Bostonian accent or New York accent, um, can be can be replicated, you know, by the software. So there's there's a lot of different ways in which this can be abused, um, and uh, you know the next we'll talk about the extortion of, uh, of of videos. You don't really do a lot of you don't, we don't really see a lot of extortion over audio. It's more about the 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 perpetrated or synthesized audio is more for social engineering at a, at a more sophisticated level, but the video the fabricated video is more about abuse cases and extortion. Um, you know when I when I say that it's usually individuals that are put in compromising positions, not because they were actually in compromising positions, but their voice and their likeness were basically overlaid or incorporated into this content. 
All right, so let's let's again in threat modeling. Here's another concept. It's called building an attack library. So we we talked about earlier about threat libraries. What is an attack library? Well, an attack library is like well, a threat is like I want to steal money from a bank, and uh, that's just a threat. So there's a possibility that I want to do something bad. An attack is actually doing it. Well, I'm going to go in and I'm going to come in as a custodian and I'm going to break into the safe, or I'm going to go into the uh, to the um, the skylight on top of the roof and breaking that way or, you know, whatever, whatever attacks were more about how do you realize your threat? And so as we look at uh, attack libraries for perpetration and impersonation, we look, here's a, a very large list of possible attacks that could happen using this type of, of uh, technology. Um, and, you know, I, I'm just going to focus on a couple of these because I know I don't want to, uh, we could spend really probably a good 45 minutes on, on these alone. So let's look at uh, this one right here, call corporate phone systems for voice samples. Now, I mentioned before that Versprite is a cybersecurity firm and we do some things like red teaming or social engineering. And one of the things that we did even before defect technology was being able to understand and study target victims. Uh, back when there was supposed to the phone systems um, largely used, you would call a VoIP or analog phone system, and oftentimes you would say, hi, this is uh, Sam. I'm not on my desk right now. Please leave me a message. If you have additional questions, please you know, call extension or whatever. And so the, the, from a social engineering aspect, even an old school way, you would try to, if you're going to perpetrate that individual, Sam in this case, in this example, you would try to study their voice and try to replicate it if you're calling somebody that they know. And so you could act as Sam and say, hi, this is Sam. You could spoof their phone number and call them. Now you don't need to do that as a human. You can just do that using defect technology. So if you can record and get enough samples of that individual, remember the last screen I showed you? It's the, the, the open source project leader said, you can record, you can basically have, uh, with five seconds of audio, you can create your own content, right? So you don't really need a lot to capture. Um, cyber criminals today also, they might go into different places and record conversations, uh, online content that you might have on different social media, um, YouTube, Facebook, etc., can provide a way for um, defect technology to learn your voice and imitate you. So there is um, a lot of different uh, attacks that can be done. Let's, talk, let's, let's look at another one. Um, so let's look at this one here, build facial synthesizer for defamation. So what does that mean? So a facial synthesizer takes an image, and some of the technology today can actually take a still image. Um, the better sources of information is going to be a video, because that way the software will learn how words are said and how the basically the lower part of your face is moving as you're saying those sentences. And so take anybody and then create a defamation script, which is something that they might say that would undermine their candidacy for you know, being a board member or in local politics or you know, at a homeowners association. You know, the list could go on and on. And so um, that content goes out. It's just simply the content and all the, the retweets, if you will, the resharings, if you will, versus the person saying, that's not me. I never said that. Right, so you, the we're going to look at the the legal responses in a second, but it's really easy to uh, leverage this type of technology in order to do very sophisticated targeted attacks, as well as um, you know attacks that that um, you know are, are are really aimed at uh, criminal objectives. All right, so at a broader scale, this is the thing that really worries me the societal implications on, you know, data is, number one, access to data such as, you know, you look at how many years have different cities been capturing, you know, video content? Where is that stored? What is the security of that content, right? Um, this might be in a data center. This might be in the cloud. This might be in, you know, a government office. And then, you know, we look at the implications of voice and video as it relates to consumer electronics, uh, also capturing a lot of our um, of our likeness, a lot of our voice, you know, there's a reason that there's big privacy clauses with Zoom, with you know WhatsApp. I'm sure you've seen the news has been 
you know, reeling from a lot of privacy concerns that Facebook is actually able to look at the messaging app and actually, you know, um, capture or just listen into a lot of, uh, you know, content. And so a lot of people are moving to other platforms like Signal. But the point is, is that there's a lot of sources where we are have our voice, our video of us, you know, as we do these conferences, I'm on video. Um, and then you have your consumer electronic IoT devices in your house. You know, you have, you know, Nest and a couple other different similar devices where, you know, we're even speaking to the different devices. Um, you know, play Beach Boys, you know, and and so these these devices, this is all data. And the, the, the big concern is the security of the data, the retention of this data, and the data use. You know, these companies, we're just trusting, we're all using, to some degree, all of these different apps. You see um, these apps here. And, you know, we don't know how that information is being shared, how if that information is compromised, the security of that information, et cetera. In addition, we have a lot of prominent universities that are actually focusing on detecting and building, you know, a lot of great new algorithms to improve recognition, you know, for AI, for robotics, for science, for medical reasons. Um, so there, there's a lot of the, the content, the data really provides a really good hotbed. Um, I have a couple different independent, independent surveillance studies I wanted to share. In London and Hyderabad were the only cities outside of China to make up the top 20 with London taking third place and Hyderabad 16th in terms of like, you know, top cities that were being uh, surveyed. In 2021, here's another one. Over 1 billion surveillance cameras will be installed worldwide according to IHS Market's latest report. Uh, there's already uh, 770 million cameras in use with 54% of these being, you know, in China. Um, so going back to my point here, there is algorithms that are being developed in the universities. There's content from different sources. And then there's the, the threat motive, financial, you know, undermining financial systems, uh, undermining government, undermining our own society and how we treat one another as humans. Um, and then, you know, this goes back to the data, all this stuff that's captured in these places here, this block, this block, this block and I should be using my pointer, these four things here are being stored in different flavors of databases with different flavors of security being applied. And the cyber criminals know this, and they, they, are, they are not foreign to the fact of putting all of this stuff together, and that's the scary part. So let's take a look at the science of deepfake technology really quick, because I don't want to go into you know, uh, algorithm valley over here and make everyone go into a uh, algorithm coma, but the, there's some interesting things related to uh, deepfake technology. Um, there's been algorithms to study facial movement and speech, so that's one. Um, and what that means is that there's been long, for a long time, there's been a science of how to detect how words go with um, muscle patterns on your face. And so um, as that gets better, the video that is produced gets almost in, in, indistinguishable compared to an authentic, you know, you guys may have seen the, um, the Obama or the Nancy Pelosi deep fake technology. You can Google it and, and see how that technology looks like and see if you're able to tell uh, which is real, which is not. Additionally, realistic speech-driven facial animation with GAN. So generative adversarial networks is the, has been the predominant way to produce uh, talking video from just simply still images. So I, I mentioned before, you can take a picture of a face and the technology would replicate and, and say, based upon the face, the, the, the AI thinks that how they would pronounce, um, you know, telemetry, you know, some people might pronounce it differently and their, their, their face might move in, in a different way. That is um, basically using, you know, GANs, um, is, which is basically the, the most predominant form of technology to, to produce talking video just from still images. And then, um, of course, in my opinion, the best way to, to produce falsified uh, video is through, you know, uh, video. So train. So a lot of this stuff of first order, order motion modeling. Um, for image animation is going to be leveraging existing video and the AI trains itself 
so that it can baseline its algorithm with other videos that are actually from a real person. Um, this particular slide here just shows a bunch of algorithms. And the reason I brought it up, what was interesting to me is that a lot of these algorithms came from like back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and it was when scientists, psychologists were studying facial recognition for uh, trying to understand you know, things like schizophrenia and Alzheimer's and other types of uh, human illnesses. So there was different studies that were done. There was a scientist named Hess that studied actually the intensity of emotion related to anger and happiness and sadness and things like that. And all of these things were studied upon in order to apply different algorithms. And those algorithms were then measured for their effectiveness. And so, um, you know, being able to recognize, you know, let's, let's look at a constructive thing, supposedly, where, you know, if you're looking at a crowd and you see, and you basically, let's say China has this capability where they look and they see that there's individuals that are angry and they also correlate, you know, individuals that are angry with maybe, let's say, you know, doing some type of crime then they could ha almost have like a minority report, if you've seen that movie, type of like uh, foreshadowing or foretelling of what, where there might be problems, like an early detection system, if you will. That is both interesting as well as scary, right? You know, for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, people like me that have always been told like, hey, you have an angry resting face. You know, I might get arrested just trying to go pick up the mail or something. Um, but, uh, you, know, you know, jokes aside, that, that there's a, there's this is just a, a small snapshot of algorithms that have been used over the years to study humans human um, human uh, uh, physical responses you know, uh, you know over different emotions and now a lot of this is actually being factored in and uh, into software that is highly user friendly so. Now, the, where we're at today in terms of DHS and the military and other countries is that there's a lot of investment and interest in detection. And there's a lot of uh, collaboration, even industry think tanks that are trying to say, well, what are you seeing or how did you detect this? And they're trying to show different types of technology to even provide visualizations <clears throat> between valid content and fake content. And so, now, now we turn the page of like, well, what are we doing about deep fake technology today? Um, there's a lot of good counter uh, uh, tools to help in detection, but um, this is going to be, you know, largely used in the hands of those that can afford it or those that have a, you know, interest for national security and things like that. Um, but for most corporations, most most individuals, we're still at a loss. Now, from the legal standpoint. <clears throat> We all know that legal, you know, any sort of legal recourse or response to really anything is always at the tail end of an offense or evolving threat patterns. And so it's no different here with deepfakes. If there is, um, if you become the victim of, you know, through defamation, um, you know, there is a lot of things that are tested as part of that from a legal, you know, standpoint. One is how it was you know, publicized, um, how it basically was, how does it identify the defamed person and what is the actual material? You know, is the defamation, you know, of, of a severe nature? Most of the stuff related to what we saw with the actresses or the actors that are on there is, is pretty derogatory, so it would fit that category. But it's always, you know, that effect, that victim teaming up with a legal team to chase who did that, you know, and that's always a problem and it takes time. And until then, what victims have is to do is simply do a lot of, you know, cease and desist for content providers that are carrying that uh, perpetrated content. Um, there's, there's some other legal implications around, like, uh, the arguments around inherency. They, they say that some, you know, material is inherently, you know, d defamatory, like, you know, porn. So that automatically, you know, validates a uh, a plaintiff's or uh, a victim's you know, case if you're know, claiming that they've been defamed. So there, there's some level of inherency uh, depending upon the, the deep fake content that was produced. Um, on the flip side, though, there is also protections, right, around uh, creative work. So someone could create a deep fake video and of someone else and call it an artistic creation and they can copyright that. So 
as with anything else in, in legal, you know, it's it's not going to be a saving grace. Definitely not. It's not going to be a very timely one, you know, if, if you fall victim. Uh, and this is more at a corporate level or consumer level or individual level, if, you know, if there is uh, someone that's affected by defakes. So um, the current legal landscape for us as individuals and as corporations is, you know, fraud, uh, perpetration for the for the purposes of financial gain through extortion or perpetration so that there could be some level of validation of a victim of uh, that a authority or authoritative request for let's say financial disbursement is coming from a real real individual of authority but in fact is actually coming from a perpetrated video or perpetrated content voice um privacy unsurprising unsurprising unsurprisingly is the overwhelming and most popular um, uh, concern, you know, the, we saw the the Zhao app that had a major privacy concern in China, uh, which is saying a lot there. But um, deepfake obviously invades privacy because it needs someone else's still image, video, or audio in order to produce fabricated content. So there is a privacy legal consideration there as well. And then from the mis misleading or deceptive content, content, this is a little bit trickier. How do you prove that the intent of deep fake use or abuse cases was actually meant to mislead or misrepresent? And so that is a it, it's 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 never a clear cut case. But I'm just kind of sharing here. What are some of the pr three prominent points of conversation around the legal uh, aspects of countering deep fake or in response to deep fake uh, uh, abuse cases? Commercial litigation is going to really revolve around, you know, a couple of things. Um, so commercial mitigation, that is. Right now, there's a lot of private companies, and, you know, NASA might have some interest in this as well, to liaise and stay more abreast of, again, uh, global think tanks that are looking to partner together to combat uh, deep fakes. Um, you know, as space gets more and more commercialized over the next, you know, century, you know, there might be some pretty prominent abuse cases for deep fake technologies as it relates to multiple different things related to space exploration, space mining, space colonization, uh, space, you know, trade in space, satellite technologies, and so forth. So there is a lot of reasons for perpetration for the purposes of uh, maybe uh, perpetrating people that have access to different technologies, different routes, different um, plans, you know, for some of the, all of the above that I mentioned. But from a commercial standpoint, companies can align with um, DARPA has this, um, this program where they are working with both private and the public sector to uh, have a way to collect bigger samples of deep fake videos that are shared so that they can learn about some of the more emerging and more advanced deep fake uh, pr productions that are out there. There's a couple different forensic tools that are also helpful. There's a semantics forensic semaphore uh, tool that is used to detect deep fake, but usually those types of tools are used by an operations team where they're seeing that they're slowly be getting more in the radar of cyber criminals or nation states that might be using deep fake technologies against them as a, a company. Um, commercially, you know, going back to operations, you know, there might be, this might be a good place for security operations centers and large organizations, agencies, et cetera, to stay abreast of like how deep fake technology is affecting their organization. What signs do they have in the dark web or, you know, online that that particular commercial entity is actually being considered to be a target um, and that one of the techniques to be used you know, could be de deep fake technology. So it, it takes some level of uh, <clears throat> tabletop planning or simulations to see where deep fake adversarial techniques could be used against a group or a company. Um, so law enforcement. So um, with with law enforcement, uh, so one of the things, I'll skip over to data detoxing for, for a second. Another thing, commercial uh, mitigation strategy is the data detoxing. Um, what that simply means is that there might be key individuals that have a very abundant online video uh, and audio profile 
that might be go above and beyond what is actually needed for marketing purposes or business purposes or whatnot. And so, I mean, there's there's several individuals in the security community where if they give a talk, they they for example they prevent um, the recording of of them on stage. They they prevent the recording of them on audio. I attribute that mostly to in cybersecurity. There's a healthy dose of paranoia, so there's um, there's always a concern that uh, there's some level of of perpetration being done against that security individual. But I think it's more realistic that that takes place against someone that is prominent in an organization um, where defamation, you know, could uh, affect the brand of the company. So, um, you know, going back to law enforcement, <clears throat> it, you know, things are going to vary, you know, state by state, um, but at a federal level, a lot of the, the, the free speech uh, really kind of provides difficulty in saying, you know, if someone is claiming a defense of like free speech for trying to create a deep fake content that is a defamation in some people's views, but in their view, it's like a free a form of free speech. Um, additional commercial mitigation. So I'm just going to read through these really quickly. Um, there's Google AI Jigsaw, which is in partnership with others in defining standards for AI principles, and they cover a lot of uh, deep fake uh, technologies there. Uh, there's a private uh, business collaboration. There's basically a lot of private companies are sharing the deep fake videos that have affected them, and they're trying to kind of uh, understand who are the bad actors that are producing this type of content, um, so that they can, you know, recognize who the en enemy is. Because right now the enemy could be anybody, it could be even individuals within an organization or a small faction within a society, a societal group. And there's universities that are also uh, collaborating a lot. In fact, in uh, Ireland this past week alone, there was a student that actually got uh, an award for their best deep fake detection capability in software. So there is a lot of people that, especially in military and, and in NASA, DARPA, that are basically looking to um, to see what how the universities are able to evolve, mostly on the detective side, um, and also the offensive side in terms of how new elusive uh, means of producing defect technology can actually lose some of the signatures or detective capabilities that the military or commercial software has. At an individual level, um, I'll conclude with this, and that is simply, you know, these the, the last couple slides, two slides, is really about what do we do as individuals? Um, yeah, you know, I, I would say, you know, be judicious about your online social media presence and, you know, determine whether or not you really need, you know, uh, pictures. Make sure that your profile is private, except for those that you know um, you 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 want to to allow them to see your photos or your even your your um, your profile picture. Um, so it might be a good time to begin to do some proper social media hygiene. Maybe have a social media hygiene night for you and the kids uh, over the weekend. Um, you know, another suggestion is maybe drop the real profile pic. You know, I always uh, recommend to my kids to um, have different aliases for different types of accounts. It makes, you know, it, it you know, all of these platforms are learning and trying to create trends and patterns and things like that. So um, it's best to be able to use the power of the platform for good purposes, but not to be a potential victim uh, where AI could uh, turn against you later on. So. Consider maybe changing your profile pic, which is something that is definitely uh, searchable. Um, I already talked about m multiple handles or puppet accounts, which is simply like multiple different accounts uh, for different types of services that you might use. Again, more of a, a pain, but if you have things like password management software on your computer, then it actually is not too bad. Um, you, know, you log into one thing as one one alias, and then log into another platform as another alias with different different pictures, maybe with an avatar pictures and things like that. Check out your uh, social media media configuration. Many people don't dive into the settings of their social media and they don't really look and see what's being used, what's being consumed, what's being shared. So make sure you, you go into that. Um, data detoxing. Oftentimes you might keep everything underneath the sun in your social media or online um, email providers and whatnot. It's, it's always good you know, to invest in some level of local repository like um, a network area storage, you know, device where you can put your pictures and things like that more, um, you know, in the comforts and the protection of your own home versus like in, in the cloud. Um, but, 
you know, the convenience of the cloud in case something were to happen to your device at home, I, I understand that it's a, it's a catch-22. Um, physical privacy shields. So um, there's going to be, you know, with with online presence, a lot of security professionals do this as well. They basically, uh, for a lot of their pictures that they take, you know, they wear things to protect their eyes. Uh, individuals are are identified, you know, through a lot of different um, forms of facial recognition. So I, I think that in the future we're going to see maybe some consumer products that are going to be looking to create some level of um, physical privacy and just in simply uh, in, in in privacy wear, if you will. Um, and then, you know, voice authentication and passphrases. One of the things I will warn the audience is that, you know, you, you guys have heard of robocalling. And one of the, the, the challenges of robocalling is, um, is that oftentimes, you know, you get these uh, robocalls or these ghost calls, and they're, they're looking oftentimes to, to, to get you to say something. You know, like, hi, this is Bob, or hey, this is Sally. And right there, that's, uh, that's content uh, as you answer the phone. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of different tools, you know, that now mobile uh, phone devices and providers do so that can protect your privacy um, so that you only kind of speak to individuals that, you know, you know or that are in your list. But it's also even easy to perpetrate that. You know, I could perpetrate someone that's on your on your phone, um, maybe mom, dad, you know. Um, but um, it's, it's easy to do a lot of spoof calls. But the point is, is that, you in general consumers best mitigation is context is you know am i expecting this individual even though it says you know somebody that i, I trust to know to be asking these types of questions contextual validation for what we as consumers uh, are presented with is really the best form of uh, validation okay so if you're interested in playing around with um with this from a technology standpoint you know check out github there's the, here's one that's a pretty cool project it's called DESA uh, uh, OSS. It's a fake voice detection. This is more on the detective side, but it allows you a way to take a lot of the deep fake audio content that's out there. Like you can download deep fake content and then build this um, build this uh, little tool and then run the uh, the different content that you've aggregated through the tool to see how it works and see you know how the the detection is able to discern you know, fact from fiction. Well, that concludes my time with you guys. Hopefully uh, you guys are not biting your nails and sweating profusely, but uh, I did enjoy the time that you guys have given me. If you do have some questions, feel free to follow uh, us on uh, uh, Twitter or LinkedIn for mostly cybersecurity, data privacy related news and tips. Um, but I really appreciate the time and uh, thanks so much for having me.